Good morning, LinkedIn. Um, I'm sorry about going live about two minutes late. Um, you know, vanity above all. I was trying to put on lipstick or look less pale. Um, you guys know here in Montreal, for those of you who are in Montreal, it's been raining, snowing, it's freezing, it was snowing again this morning. Um, so not only are we in isolation, we can't even really go on walks. Um, so I feel that I'm progressively just getting paler and just sadder sitting here at home. But you already know that the absolute highlights of my days um, and what keeps me motivated and energized is when I have the opportunity to do these LinkedIn Live interviews and interview really, really awesome people that um, I know all of you are learning from because you're sending me so many messages and um, so many emails after. Thank you very much for that. But just very selfishly, um, this is extremely beneficial to me. It not only gives me energy, but I'm also learning so much, which is really awesome. Um, so today we're going to be talking about podcasting and how to get podcasts right because certainly they've become a huge trend. Right now, I think there must be a little bit of a lull in uh, in podcasts, in consumption of podcasts, I think. But we're going to ask our guest um, because usually, typically, we'll listen to podcasts when we're driving, right? At least I do. And we haven't been driving that much because there's nowhere to go. So I'm wondering how that has affected um, you know, podcasting. But nonetheless, I mean, we are going to get our freedoms back and we're going to be back on the road. Um, so we're going to listen, we're going to start listening to podcasts again. And so here's a story for you. Um, so podcasting had been on my radar for a little while. Um, you guys know I love interviewing people. I love getting interesting information out in the public and um, something that appeals to me. And so podcasting had been on my radar, but didn't know much about how to do it right. Um, so never really started doing it until the organization uh, that I'm in called EO, Entrepreneurs Organization, um, an incredible network of um, successful entrepreneurs from all over the globe, um, I think in over 45, over 50 countries, um, launched was launching a new podcast, a new global podcast called Forum Confidential, okay? Because we're in groups within EO that are called Forums, and so Forum Confidential uh, was the name of the podcast. We were supposed to engage, you know, in deep talks, the um, the show hosts and the guests. And so EO was looking for um, hosts, regional hosts for the podcast. And the idea was to give it this global flair. And so, you know, the U.S. host would interview entrepreneurs in the U.S. and then, you know, have just from every every corner of the globe. And they were looking for hosts, and uh, somebody sent me the application and said, you should apply to be the Canadian host. And I said, you know, I don't know much about podcasting, but I'm a headhunter. I know how to interview people, and I'm genuinely curious and in getting new information. So I'm like, and, and the, like, the format of that podcast was you had to go deep. You had to really go deep and get this really you know, profound conversation going, not just superficial. And so I thought I like that in general in life. So this is for me. I applied, um, did my interviews, the whole process, and got selected. So once it got selected, I was like, well, if they assume that I can do it, right, a lot of people applied, then I've got it. Like, I've got it in the bag. How hard can it be? Um, got a very fancy microphone because, you know, when you have something fancy, you think that really you are set. Um, found an awesome person to interview, a fellow entrepreneur who had been chapter president for us a couple of years prior, Chandra Hall, massively charismatic, really good storyteller, good stories. I'm like, I'm like, I'm set. What else do I need, right? So he came to my office. We sat down. We had the best conversation, best chat within time, just everything. So I uploaded my episode, and I was like, I am great. Like, this is awesome. And as all the different hosts from different parts of the world, they're submitting their episodes. They had somebody who was reviewing them and listening to them. And then we get an email saying, <laughs> okay, guys. Um, we're going to have a call uh, with a podcasting consultant because it looks like you all might benefit from some training. So we're like, oh. And then on top of that, they, the consultant, this amazing consultant that they hired to 
tell us actually how to do podcasting right. They also hired her to do individual one-on-one -on -one sessions with us. She listened to our episodes and was going to give us, you know, really specific feedback pertaining to us and how each one of us could get better, okay? So I get on the call with her, and of course she's the guest today, right? This is leading up to who the guest is. This is not a completely unrelated story. So Cassidy Atkins, the owner of um, a company that, uh, that does podcasting and, and helps companies set up their, or individuals set up their podcasting. Um, she got on a call with me and she was like, Marina, there's some good news. There's some bad news. And I was like, okay. She's like, listen, amazing interview. It was great. Like you guys, you were just going back and forth, going deep. You clearly had amazing rapport. Your questions were fantastic. His answers were amazing. Like it was just great. Like it was a standout interview. It was phenomenal. It was so authentic, so real. And I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, this is great. She's like, I just want to let you know, you're going to have to re-record it. <laughs> and I go, Hey, what what went wrong? And she's like, well, if you listen to it, the sound is really off. There's so much echo that you really have to focus to hear what you guys are saying and not just turn off and you know move on to the next interview. So you guys can imagine how embarrassed I was with you know my tail between my legs messaging. And this was also a couple of months after we had done that interview messaging Sean and be like, yeah, so listen, good news, bad news, we're great, but I'm just not great at podcasting. Um, and we and we redid it. And when we redid it, I had taken into account all of Cassidy's um, you know, training recommendation, incredible insight and tips. It was successful, it got accepted, it was published. I will include link in this event page so you guys could listen to it. It was it was a check mark and go. So there are so many people that I hear from that are saying that they want to launch a podcast too. And I feel that I will try to give some sort of advice, but it's, you know, broken telephone because I'm just saying what I heard. And I was thinking, what better guest to bring on? Um, why don't I bring on Cassidy so that I and we can pick her brain and ask her questions about podcasting. Um, so I'm asking all of you to do me a favor. As you're watching right now, please go into comments and tell me, do you have a podcast? Well, if you do, drop drop a link so that you can self-promote. Um, if you don't have a podcasting, then why are you listening to this? Are you thinking of launching one? And if yes, on what topic? Okay, so don't be shy. Do that. I just shared my original failure with it. So don't be shy and share where you at with, with yours. Okay. And without further ado, here's Hi. my awesome guest, Cassidy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? It's oh, so and of course you're like so prepared. Look at that microphone. <laughs> here's <laughs> here's my hold on. Here's my setup. There's yours. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. <laughs> it's so funny hearing your side of the story because I remember on my side, like getting on that call, I was like, man, this is going to be so hard just because like it was one of the best interviews that I came across during that whole process. And then I was like, sorry, get back to the drawing board. <laughs> So it was equally as hard for me as it was for you. I hate asking people to redo stuff. <laughs> yeah, I could tell. And you really like, you laid it on so thick with the positives, right? <laughs> so you're like, it's, it's great. It's great. Um, so Cassidy, I'm curious to know, just to rewind and before we get into the tips and tricks and your, you know, your insight, I'm curious to know what got you into podcasting? How did you get started? Yeah, definitely. So I've had nine years of professional media experience. I've pretty much done anything in the media space. I've done radio, I've done TV, I've done journalism, online journalism, all that kind of stuff. Um, primarily, my main, um, you know, history is in radio, actually. And so that's where I got a, most of my foundational knowledge about at least the production side of stuff. And you know, when I when I was about 17 is when I first started in radio, and um, it didn't take me super long to realize how corrupt corporate media can be. 
<laughs> I'll save you that exact story, but it didn't take me long. And, you know, I really just through a series of events wanted to go on this journey of helping bring truth back into the media space. And uh, I started my company. And so not a lot of people know that background because, you know, there's something really special about the time we're living in. And especially right now with everything that's going on in the world, it seems like everyone's starting to understand whatever side of the aisle you're on. Like, hey, fake news is real. Like, this is a serious problem, right? And for the first time in American history anyway, if you ask the average person um, who they trust more, someone on a TV or someone on you know the radio or whatever, or someone on a podcast or a LinkedIn Live or something like that, everybody says someone on a podcast. So this is the first time in history that people, and or at least Americans, are taking the word of someone like you and me, a normal person, more than the people at the top of corporate media. So I think it's a really interesting time to get your voice out there, get your message out there. You can create real impact. And it's like the voice has been given back to the people. So that's what I'm super passionate about. That's why I even started the company um, is to help people get their message out there and help them stand in their truth and get their voice out there. And uh, it's been a good ride. You know, I've internationally trained podcasters like yourself. You know, I've uh, launched and produced multiple number one podcasts, um, including my own. So it's been a, definitely a good ride. It's been fast and furious, but taking the old school knowledge of corporate media in the new school age of podcast has been a super fun journey so that's pretty okay, much so that's super interesting you know when you're saying giving the voice back to the people that resonates with me right i mean i grew up in a totalitarian regime where the people had no voice right and so um i don't know if you know that about me but i was, I I was in the soviet crazy. union i grew up in post-soviet ukraine before moving to canada um so okay that concept just really resonated with me um and just that yeah the idea of controlling the narrative versus the media and especially now yes you're right we're seeing a lot of um you know kind of but anyways we're not going to get into the politics right <laughs> now. it resonates with me however i'm wondering as much as it does um you know ring true to me um do you think there's danger maybe though when people start because a lot of people will position themselves as subject matter experts and will start very convincingly communicating their opinions um, and now on these different platforms but they might not necessarily be providing you know well researched depending on their topic right for sometimes it's just entertainment or you know we're doing interviews but for people who really start getting into topics you know you see right now a lot of people putting out content um, on COVID and you know vaccinations and things that they might not necessarily know much about. Do you think there's danger also there with um, so much content coming out? Yeah, definitely. You know, there is like a lot of self-awareness that needs to go into like the listener side of stuff, you know, like who are you listening to? That's always important. You got to be self-aware. You got to check the facts and all that kind of stuff. But I do think there is some... Um, you know, danger to that for sure. But really, I think that the podcast space um, is almost like this special little uh, like corner of media because it seems like, at least right now, you know, at least the time we're recording this, that results really speak for themselves with the podcast world. Like if you say, if I say like I'm, you know, running a, you know, a Facebook ad campaign that's converting, converting like a billion dollars, you know, like some, and if I get on a podcast and try to teach everyone my system and people aren't getting those same results or people like somehow found like my Google or like whatever, my uh, uh, ad account or something like in, it seems like my point is, is there's a lot of fact finders in the podcast space and it's very <laughs> obvious who the fakers are. And so it kind of stands out, not only in the listeners almost holding them accountable, but in just numbers, like people don't like listen to it. You know what I mean? Like, it seems like definitely that there's, there's a little bit of like a bubble around the podcast space as far as like bad news goes, but especially with the COVID stuff um, specifically, I know we're not going to get into that too much, but Apple and Google and Spotify and all these um, destinations where people are consuming podcasts, if you're not an accredited fact checked um, news affiliate, and if you have COVID in your show notes or in your show title, your show's getting pulled from the directory because oh like, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, so they're pulling stuff from the directory because they're like, hey, we don't know you, you don't know us, we're gonna keep our people safe. So that is one thing I've been really impressed with in the podcast space how um, aggressively they're going after stuff, and it could even be just someone bringing it up, like, hey, what to do in your business with COVID? Like their intentions are positive, but the directories are taking that extra step like 
hey, let's just like not even talk about it right now. Like, just go ahead and keep serving your audience. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's interesting. And then, okay, so we, our conversation is aimed at helping people either get started with podcasting or elevate their game. Okay. So people who are rookies and intermediate. Okay. Um, do you feel that the podcasting space is not overly crowded yet? And then if somebody wants to launch a podcast, how important is it to be really niche? Or do you like, how do you choose the right topic, the right angle? You know, a lot of people also overthink when launching any type of content initiative. Yeah start overthinking because you want to stand out, but then how do you stand out? So what is that first step that you recommend to people as they start just reflecting on the idea? Yeah, definitely. So I wanted to answer your question about, do I think if the podcast space is overcrowded yet? So this is one of my favorite parts of just this conversation, you know, about podcasting is because I think that it is one of the most untapped spaces in the media, yeah. you know, content marketing, content strategy, all that kind of stuff. I think it's one of the most untapped spaces because you got to look at the stats. So listen to how crazy this is. So as of the end of March, 2020, there is 900,000 podcast in the directories. So you might be thinking like 900,000, like that's quite a lot, but if you look at blogs, there's billions of blogs with a B. <laughs> there is millions of YouTube channels. Everyone and their dog is doing Facebook Live. You know what I mean? So I think 900,000 isn't that much. But if you take a closer look at that number, there's actually only 250,000 active podcasts. So the definition of an active podcast is you have more than 10 episodes <laughs> and you had um, a new episode within the last 90 days. So if you've had a new episode the last three months and if you're past 10 episodes, like you're already killing the game. <laughs> so right. it's so crazy. But I think that that answers the second question is what is the first thing you need to consider? Like right. why are people stopping at 10? Most of the time, it's because they don't have a topic that they can, they can actually commit to. So right. I don't like entertaining uh, like people when they're like, should I be niche? Should I be broad? Should I be this? Should I be that? Because I don't think there's like a real formula. I think the biggest answer is, can you commit to this topic? Can you come up with more than you know enough content to keep this going? And so most people have a weekly podcast that's like industry standard. You know, you can do more, you can do less. Tons of people do it. You know, it kind of just fits into whatever you're schedule is. Um, but this, I would say the standard is weekly, right? So say you take off a week for Christmas and New Year's, you got to come up with at least 50 topic ideas to have a year of podcast ideas. Like, can you do that around the topic niche or industry that you're wanting to talk about on your podcast? It really is that simple. <laughs> okay. And so then the topic does have to be in your opinion, either niche, niche or industry specific. Like it does have to have one or the other. It doesn't have to have one or the other. I work with people that have like society and culture shows and literally they just talk about anything and everything, whatever's on their mind. That's what they talk about. Um, I think that if you want to make a lot of impact really quickly and especially if you have a business, it's a great, you know, way to grow your business. So it has to really, it comes down to as well, like who the individual is. Like if you just love stories and you just love people and you just love talking to people, do that, do an interview style show. But if you want to be strategic about it, of course, do, you know, go niche, be industry uh, specific. I typically work um, with six to seven figure businesses. So they're super niche, like they're in their industry. They're trying to be the, the expert or they are the expert already. So it really just depends on what your show idea is and what you can commit to and what's really like, how is your podcast going to fit into your life? I think that sometimes, you know, people just start a podcast because it's kind of the trending thing right now. So if you can be strategic with your show, like, will it actually benefit my ideal audience? Can it, will it benefit, you know, my ideal, like, passion project you know like if you have a passion project or a side hustle like can it can that uh benefit it in some way so it doesn't necessarily have to be broad or niche but if it is if it's in your benefit to be niche like if it's going to make sense with everything else you got going on then definitely do that if you just want to have something that's not all about business and it's your passion project and you're displaying people's stories go broad and do that. So it's really just like, what do you, what do you need as a person? Do you need to grow your business? Do you want to influence people or do you want to, 
you know, have something fun in your life. <laughs> have fun, yeah. <laughs> the latter resonated. Um, maybe because there's not that many fun activities left for us to engage in. I'm starting to get really worked up about the whole social isolation thing. You know, I've said it in um, another interview. I thought of myself as an ambivert, you know, like in the middle of an extrovert and an introvert. Mm -hmm. Social isolation made it very clear. No extrovert. <laughs> no, I need to be out about and not even it's not even about hanging out with people, but just seeing different things, just being stimulated with different things. Yeah. Outside. I digress. Um, question. What about coming up with the name of a podcast? How important is it to have um, catchy name? Um, I don't know, um, maybe the just like the branding of it are the best practices of things that stand out, like super colorful, or I think your scheme is more black and white, right? Yes, definitely. Um, so are there best practices there? Like how do you choose? Well, for example, I've been um, working on my own podcast. Um, I think that's what stops me the most, literally, is the thumbnail, you know, the image. I'm like, should I put my face? Should I not put my face? Should there just be text? Is there something else that stands out? What in your experience? Um, stands out the most. Yeah. So with your specifically regarding your artwork, man, this is definitely a subject that stumbles a lot of podcasters up, not just the decision, but also the regulations you have to follow within Apple. So Apple has a ton of regulations on um, what Apple or what artwork can be and what it can't be. So if you've tried to launch a podcast in the past and it got rejected for some reason, I would almost like I would be willing to bet anything that it was your artwork. So let me tell you <laughs> about the the rules that you have to follow and then how you can be creative inside those. What so, are the rules? What? What are the rules? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so your show artwork has to be 3000 by 3000 pixels in size. After that, it has to be in all RGB color tones. It can't have any destination logos on it, which means you can't have an Apple logo, Google logo, Spotify, any anything like that on it because they don't want people to think it's an Apple endorsed podcast and they don't want to have their competitors in their like being promoted in their app, right? So it makes sense. After that, you can't have any Apple like products on your artwork, which means you can't have iPads, iPhones, ear pods, anything like that on your actual artwork. Cause again, they don't want people to think it's a Apple indoor show and they have it phrased where it's Apple like products. So even if it's a smartphone, that's not an iPhone, but it resembles an iPhone, you can't have it on there. So Apple like products. And then the one that stumbles people up the most is it has to be under 500 kilobytes in size. So 3000 by 3000 pixels in dimension, but the actual file size has to be under 500 kilobytes. So all that convoluted stuff is what you, the lines you have to follow. But on the other side of that, like what's really going to serve you and catch your ideal audience's eye? So this is definitely a question I get asked a lot. Could I use my picture? Should I not use my picture? And really, it doesn't matter. That's going to be up to you. I always come back to the strategy behind it. Are you going to be running a lot of, you know, um, ads with your face on it? Is your face recognizable, recognizable in your niche? Are you pretty, you know, well known? Like do people see your face? And, oh, that's Cassidy. <laughs> I thought you were saying, are you pretty? <laughs> You're like, are you pretty? <laughs> well, no. <laughs> I was like, okay, okay, uh huh. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not. I'm not that savage right now. <laughs> I haven't <laughs> had my coffee yet, so maybe I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah. So, are you, you know, pretty well known? Are you, um, you know. Do people know your face? Is that going to make sense? Because you have to think about it. Your artwork is going to show up like an inch big. Like it's going to exist on a an app most likely. So how is your face going to catch somebody's attention? You know, it also does help build trust. So do you want to build trust or do you want to get like a lot of downloads pretty quickly? Typically, a lot of the successful shows... In the entrepreneurial space, it's a little different. Like most entrepreneurs use their face because they're kind of like the face of the brand and it just kind of makes sense with what they've got going on already. So oh, entrepreneurs definitely... are just vain. That's all, right? That's all there is. It's yep. just a quantity. Mm. Yep, that is definitely true. So uh, as an entrepreneur myself, we can, we, and you, we can hate on it. We can hate on our own kind, right? right? <laughs> we can oh, be wow. honest. 
<laughs> so yeah, is it going to serve you at the end of the day? Or will having mostly type driven, like really big type, you know, contrasting colors, will that pop off the page better and communicate your message? So I also think that picking a really good title is what's going to help you as well. Because, you know, you have to think of your title as so many people as well. Think about it. Everything comes down to SEO. Everything is a search engine these days. So a lot of people do like, you know, the Cassidy Adkins experience or, you know, the Cassidy, you know, audio show or whatever. But it, I got to be honest, like no one is searching my name. And that's not like some weird, like, you know, like sad sack. I'm not like digging on myself. I'm saying like no one most likely is looking for Cassidy Atkins. I spell my name with two Y's. Like, I'm hard about to, find... to say that, Cassidy, your name is not easy to spell, right? No, it is not. Your name is like my last name. It's not easy. No, it is not. People, no one spells their name with two Y's. But hey, that's how it is. I just got to live with it. But no one else is searching for it, right? Like people have a hard time spelling my name anyways. So they're for sure not going to spell it right trying to find my podcast. So you have to think like, what are people actually searching? Like, is there a way you can um, bring real clarity and real definition to your show through your title without anybody ever clicking play? So if that title is on your artwork and it's real big and I can read it and I'm like, oh, you know, that's, you know, social media hacks 101 or whatever it could be. I'm, that's, a, that's a terrible name, but it's an example. You know, like what are people searching? And I see it like, oh, social media 101. Like this is what I need right now. Does that make sense? Like right. what's going to be what serves you best in the search engine? Not mm -hmm. necessarily your name. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. And then I remember that one of the tips you gave us um, when you were uh, training us as a group uh, for Forum Confidential was that when you're launching a new show, best practices um, is to launch a bunch of episodes at the same time and then to start adding consistently. So can you talk about that? Why not just start with one at a time? Let's say it's a weekly show and just drop one per week from the get-go. Yeah, definitely. So industry standard is to launch with at least three episodes for your launch because it really makes sense. We're a binging culture. <laughs> Like we have got to binge stuff immediately, but also it makes sense as far as that like, no trust factor. Like people got to like you, they got to know you and they got to trust you to keep, you know, listening to your show because it takes, I feel like a pretty big commitment for someone to subscribe to your show. Like podcasting is in your schedule. You know, you spoke to it at the beginning of the interview. You were like, I listen to it when I drive, like I'm going, I'm going somewhere like, you know, every Tuesday a show comes out and that's my Tuesday drive to work podcast, right? That's how most people are listening to it. It's in their schedule somehow. So, you know, if you are coming out with a show every Wednesday, like, what am I doing on Wednesday? How can you fit into my, my life? That's what listeners are thinking. How does this podcast benefit me and fit into my life, right? So why you want to launch with three episodes is because typically that first episode is what I like to call that listener handshake episode. It's like who you are, what the show's going to be about, the listener benefit, like, hey, listen to this show. This is what you're going to get, right? Like, that's what you want to cover in the first episode. And so and let's say if my format is going to be all interviews, that first episode ideally then is not an interview and it's more of that introductory yeah, it's you it's you saying like, hey, these are the type of people I'm going to bring to you. This is why I care about these stories. This is how it's going to benefit you. Here's a little bit of my history. Because an interview style show, you're the only thing that's consistent about your show. Yeah, you have consistently good interviews, but people are falling in love with you, not necessarily the person on your show. Because if the interviewer sucks, I'm not listening. You know, so you got to still uh, establish that relational authority with your listeners up front. Like, who is this lady? Why is she even starting this show? Why does she care so much? All that stuff is great to display in that first episode. And then when you go into really great content for those other two episodes in your launch, it makes it a way easier decision for people to hit that subscribe button, download the show every week and join you on that journey. It's really hard to make the decision of do I care about this content enough to add it in my schedule off of just one episode. So mm -hmm. you got to give them a little bit more and of course it definitely does help with downloads right up front it can help you get on the charts and all that good stuff so you can have a more successful launch with more than one download ahead you know if i come out with five episodes you know someone listens to it and i got five downloads instead of just one so the math behind it makes sense as well okay interesting that makes sense i'm hearing a plane flying that is so 
and I need such an unusual sound these days. Right. So that's <laughs> fine. Why? I have so many questions about it. It's um, like a okay, and so you mentioned now a few times, um, you know, it, it seems that, but I just want to clarify, it's important to release episodes on the same day of the week at the same time. If that consistency is important, you can just be random and release kind of when they're coming in. Yeah, so I really like sticking to the same day, same time. It just builds trust with your audience. People know when it's coming. If you if say if I typically come out on Tuesdays and then I drop a show on Thursday, like it kind of people on that Tuesday are like, wait, are they coming out with a new show? Did they stop? You know, you never want your audience to like question if you're going to be there for them or not. So I think consistently is really good, and then maybe sprinkling in some bonus episodes if you want to. That's up to you, but most, okay, interesting. Okay. yeah, most likely it's going to serve you the best, depending on, again, your niche or industry or what you choose, um, to have a weekly, same time, same place, every week podcast. Okay. And what about length? Yeah. So typically this is, this is going to be different for each and every podcaster, each and every show, each and every ideal audience, you know, if I had a podcast for busy moms, you know, with specifically for moms that have like two to three, three plus kids, right? They probably don't have a lot of time to listen to my hour and a half interview with so-and-so. So you probably want like really quick tips, really good information. They can listen to why the kids are getting up, getting ready for school. Well, not anymore, but you know what I mean? <laughs> I right. know what you mean. <laughs> right. So what is your ideal listener going to be doing and what show do they need from you? I say try to keep any interview or any show at least under an hour because typically across the board, if you go into your Apple analytics after you launch a few episodes, you can see your consumption rate. And that's where things get really interesting on an individual podcast basis. You know, I've known podcasters that have hour and a half, two hour episodes and they they're phenomenal. People consume them like crazy. You know, Joe Rogan is the biggest podcaster in the world. He's got four hour episodes. And then I've had podcasters that have uh, had five minute episodes every week and they've hit number one. So the same thing between five, the five minutes. Mi it's yeah. Short. Yep. So the same thing between the five minute and the four hour long episode is it's good content all the way through. So there's a few things like when it comes to the timing conversation that I like to bring up, like one, Make sure your content is good all the way through. If you have a topic and you're like, I think I can get maybe 15 minutes out of this, go with that. Just go with the 15 minutes. You know you can over-deliver. You know you can serve well because here's what I see happening with podcasters. They do this. They're like, all right, I'm going to have an hour long show no matter what. This is what, this is my goal. And so after that, say the, you know, it ends around 45 minutes and then podcasters just start BSing for the last 15 minutes, okay. which is like the worst thing you could possibly do. Cause then your content drops for the last 15 minutes or you're having a great interview and it's an hour long and you know, now it's going over, it's around that hour 10 mark and you're like trying to wrap things up and speed up your guests. And then you actually start robbing your listeners of content. You actually, you know, it's always better to tell that extra story or share that extra stat or add that extra quick tip at the end. You know, if you're having a great interview or if you're having a great show and it's going well, but it's going over your allotted time, don't worry about it. Like if you're having good content, just go with it. But after you get into that rhythm, so have a have a time, what I'm saying, that you're pretty, like, reasonable about. Like, I'm going to have a 15-minute show, and if it goes over, it goes under, perfect, as long as the content's always good. But after you have a few episodes, going into your Apple Podcast Connect section and seeing the consumption rate, like, if people, if you're having an hour-long show and you think it's good content and people are dropping off around 30 minutes, like, it's not good content. You got to switch it up, right? So really, like, having a time you're going for, but not being married to it, and then see what the numbers are. See what your audience actually needs from you. And then, of course, you can always give people permission to bow out or, you know, explain why it's it's a short episode. You know, you can always build a relationship with your listener just by saying like, hey, you know, I've got Cassidy on the show today. We're going over. We went over our typical 60 minute time window, but this interview is still going to really serve you. It just kind of gives people permission to stick around or bow out or, hey, you know, it's been a crazy week. I only have five minutes, but this five minutes is really going to be the best hack for you moving into this next week. So you got to have that dialogue and have that permission and conversation with your listener. Interesting. And I, I think that 
you know, what you're saying resonates because it's just best practices when it comes to content creation, period, right? Even right. if something as, uh, you know, uh, simple as uh, putting together a resume, putting together a CV, right? I consult a lot of people because that's my business. Um, I'm in, in the headhunting business. So people will often say, you know, what's the best length of a CV? Does it have to be one page? Does it have to be two, three? What's the maximum, minimum? And there is none. It depends on the quality of your content, right? If you have enough to say, which is really, you know, will be interesting, pertinent, will sell you as a candidate, then it's as many pages as you need for that within reason, right? As you said, when right. we're going to 10, 10 hours doing a podcast. Um, and if one page is enough, then that's enough. It goes, it's the same with LinkedIn content. They do a lot of, um, I'm very active on LinkedIn, which by the way, you need to be too. So we'll need to talk about that. I know, I do not, I just, like, I, I created it and then you DM'd me the next day <laughs> and you were yeah. like, you need to up your game. I was like, I know, I don't know how to use it. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about it. You've taught Sounds me, good. so I'll teach you. Um, you need to do that. But so it's very similar with content, right? Again, people will often ask, well, you know, for posts, you know, how long should they be? It really depends on what you have to say, right? If it's short and punchy, then that's how long. If it's long and you elaborate, but it's good quality, then that's how long. So it's interesting and, and it makes sense. Um, okay, so length we spoke about, um, just the general, the branding of it, the angle, that's great. Now the piece that killed me, which is, well, and then I would love to go also into best interview practices, how to make it engaging, how to make it interesting, because you have a lot of, um, you had a lot of interesting tips there too. Um, but so what does somebody need in order to get started? Uh, what do we need, first of all, as far as technology, and then the ideal space for it? Yeah, definitely. So obviously you need a mic. <laughs> it depends on what type of show you're going to have. Depending yeah, like on how good of a mic, like what does it have to be? Like how fancy do it go? Just all those tips. And also because I remember, so I, I got the Yeti, which is, you said that's like, that's, that's a good one to be using, but I was using it all wrong with the settings on the back. So I don't know if you have one where you can show what you showed me of how to set it up, depending on where you're seated versus the guest. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, I'll definitely show you the some Yeti tricks. I do love the blue Yeti. That's typically like, um, it's either that or the ATR 2100, what people love in the podcast space. These are two great like startup mics because, you know, you're just starting your podcast. You don't need to spend 500, 600, a thousand dollars on a good mic. Like just spend, I would say set aside at least like a hundred bucks just, and you'll probably have a lot left over, but just in your mind, know you're probably going to invest at least a hundred bucks in a good USB microphone. So that's what I like to say, but it also depends on what um, type of show you actually have. So if you're doing a solo cast show, if you, it's just me and a microphone, I love the ATR 2100. That's what I have here right now. If you have um, an interview style show um, remotely, you know, like right now, like we're doing a remote style interview, the ATR is really great for that as well. If you have um, guests in the same room, is where the Yeti definitely comes into play because the Blue Yeti actually has four separate settings on it. So right. I'm actually going to, uh, can I actually share my screen? Is that yeah. possible? Okay, cool. Yeah, you see on the bottom, do you have a little icon? Oh, I see it. You know what, I'll just show you on the Yeti. <laughs> I don't want to make it complicated. Oh, okay, cool. So this is the Blue Yeti microphone. Most people love it. It's kind of like the flagship podcast mic. Um, but like I said, there is settings on it. But I just wanted to point out, this is great if you're doing a solo cast show. If you go to a lot of conferences and you know that you can like get an interview, like have it set up in your hotel room, like go interview people in the hotel room real quick. Um, it travels really well. It's super hard wearing. Um, it, there's just a lot you can do with this microphone. So I do love this because the versatility but if it if you're just doing it alone and you're not really going anywhere then the ATR is a little bit cheaper and really good as well but like we said there's definitely a bit of a learning curve with this microphone one of my biggest pet peeves and you will only ever know this uh, if you're in the podcast industry most of the time but one of the biggest mistakes the most common mistakes that people make with this mic is they use it like this never trust a podcaster that uses their blue yeti like this because they have no idea what they're doing <laughs> That was me until you told me otherwise. Right. So it would make sense. This is kind of, in my opinion, I'm like, this is Blue Yeti's problem. Of course, everyone thinks that, like, this is how the mic is supposed to be. But there's actually no microphone up top. The microphone is actually right here. 
So you have to be speaking directly at the Blue Yeti uh, logo right there to get the best sound if it's just you in the room. Now, there's actually three separate mics within this mic. There's one on this side, this side, and of course the front, like I just told you. And how you activate those is on the patterns on the back. Now, you're gonna have to uh, see what works best for you and your style, but I wanna run through, oops, sorry, the uh, settings just really quickly. Can you see it? Yeah. Can you see them? Okay. Yeah. So the infinity sign on the side is what opens up all of the microphones so this is like really good if you wanted to um like have a let me just go ahead and put it on there this is really good if you wanted to have like an acoustic set in your house for some reason like this is really good for uh, recording music because it opens up all sides of it you can just put it in the middle and that's what's going to work best for that next on the upside down heart is what you're going to need if you are used or if you're doing a solo cast show, this is the cardioid mode that only activates this mic in the front. So when you're talking, you're just speaking into it. No other sound is being picked up. It's just you speaking directly in to the mic. So the next one is the circle. And that is what opens up again, all sides of the mic, which is really good for, um, I would say maybe more than two people interviews. Um, it does let in a lot of noise. It's a lot less condensed. The first mode that opens up the sides that works well for live music typically um, is a little bit more like condensed. It kind of like compresses it a little bit, but this just is like no holds bar. Everything in the world's being recorded. So you definitely have to do a lot of post editing in that um, setting, I would say, but it is a good setting. If you know, if you're trying to pick up ambient noises or if you're trying to pick up, um, just a bunch of different voices from a bunch of different areas, but typically I never have never ever used the circle setting if you can avoid it. And then this figure eight at the end, the one on its side right there next to the circle is what is going to open up this microphone and this microphone in the back. So this is what's going to be perfect for your interviews within the same room. This is the bi-directional mode. So if you and I were sitting across from each other, it'd be picking me up and this side up. Also, I recommend getting like boom arms with stuff like that. So it kind of just makes sense when you can hang it up. And it's like in between, I don't know if you can see it, <laughs> but if it's like in between you and your guest, it just kind of makes sense to have it hanging like that. And that bi-directional mode is definitely the best. The last tip I'll give you with the Blue Yeti is this gain mic. This gain is going to let going to let more or less noise in depending on what you want. So typically if I'm recording through this and it's just me, I have it on the upside down heart and then I have the gain all the way down because it's not letting in enough uh, or it won't let in um, a lot of sound. The lower the gain is, the less sound it'll let in. The higher the gain, the more sound it'll let in and the more chance, you know, like a plane flying over is going to get picked up and all that kind of stuff. So what I recommend on how to figure out your gain is just getting on like a Zoom call alone and just saying to yourself when you hit record, like, all right, this is the gain at three o'clock. This is the gain at six o'clock. This is the gain at nine o'clock. This is the gain at noon. You know, going through the gain and listening to what it sounds like um, in your specific room. So I don't know if you want to come back on. <laughs> But yeah, yeah I'm well, listening. By the way, I'm like intensely listening. Right. Because you, you. I remember when you were explaining those things, and you also sent me some images so that I remember. I wrote it all down, right? And then I would be going um, to interview people, and uh, so many people thought I was so pro. And with the first part, I've been putting the microphone, you know, pointing to the ceiling. People would be saying, you know, but why aren't you pointing it to us? And I was like. No, you know, it's, Don't even worry it's about on the it. side, it's like, you know, or people would sit next to me. I'm like, no, we need to be across from each other. I felt very professional doing that. So those are really good tips. Yeah, um, definitely. That mic is incredible and it typically works for any style of podcast you're going to do, but that learning curve can be pretty steep. But once you know, like you can get an amazing sound out of it and it's like less than a hundred bucks. So definitely love that microphone, but no microphone 
is good enough for a bad room. So you got to know what room you're going to record in. And that is definitely um, something important. I'm super glad you asked because a lot of people don't even think to ask that question. Uh, so what I like to do is explain what room you should record in by a term that I coined the bouncy ball theory. If you can get a bouncy ball and throw it in a room and it bounces all over the place, that's exactly what's going to happen to your voice. So if you've got big windows, hardwood floors, you know, all that kind of stuff. If your desk is glass, like that is going to bounce all over the place. Your voice is just like a bouncy ball. So a lot of podcasters that I work with and even some of the ones at the top of the industry record in a closet. Because all the clothes, you know, all the carpet, it just dampens the sound in there. And if you throw a bouncy ball in a closet, it typically is not going to be that fun. It's going to hit the clothes. It's going to stop, right? So think of your voice as a bouncy ball. One thing you can do, you can get like cheap sound panels like this. I got, This is like a 24 pack. It was like 20 bucks on Amazon. So these definitely do make a big difference. Sound panels are super, super cheap. So definitely go ahead and try those out. Um, if you have, if you, if you just heard me and you're like, dang it. My whole house has hardwood floors and big windows. Like, that's awesome. But you can get some cheap stuff like this. Um, it'll definitely upgrade your sound quality. And picking the best room is definitely going to be smart because especially if you're doing um, – uh, like r remote interviews, if you need your internet, then you got to make sure you have a good room with good internet as well. So you got to also add that piece into it. So what's the room in your house that a bouncy ball will have the least amount of fun and that internet is the strongest is pretty much the best way to answer that question. Interesting. And now that we're talking about recording remotely, which obviously if I'm sitting in my closet, chances are I'm recording remotely, right? Right, right. Um, that would make for an awkward invitation to invite the guests over. Um, but so for remote recording, I know that, um, and I remember telling you that Zoom is very popular. A lot of people use it. And then you told me that it was not ideal. Um, and um, I didn't listen to you, and I did use Zoom with a guest anyways, and exactly what you had said was going to happen happened. Um, so talk about that as far as technology to use to record, why not Zoom, and then what do you recommend instead? Yeah, definitely. So Zoom is definitely not ideal for audio. I love Zoom. I use Zoom for everything. They did a great job of making a video conference software. They did not do a good job of making a recording software. Okay. Audio is definitely what is lacking in their um, toolbox, if you will. So the, my biggest two main things, and there is some settings um, in Zoom that I can tell, you know, I, I can share with you that will help increase it, um, like in, make it sound a little bit better, but it's not, it's still not going to be amazing. I'm not a big fan of Zoom for rem, uh, remote recordings because they have a lot of audio ducking. And what that is, if you and I started talking over um, each other or say, uh, you know, you said something and I laughed, like even any sort of noise or if I like breathed in too hard, it's going to mute both of our mics. I've noticed that. And yeah. that's, yeah, that's a massive problem because that could be some of the best parts of the interview, especially if you're laughing at your guests. If they say something funny and you start cracking up and then all of a sudden it's just silent and awkward for the listener, it's terrible. So definitely always want to avoid audio ducking. And then also there's a lot of audio drifting as well, which means that your track and my track will blend over when you download it. So it sounds like we're talking over each other. So it's definitely not amazing. And if you or your guest have any unstable internet, then it's going to make those weird robotic noises. I'm sure you've heard it on Zoom where it's like, mm, you know, it like makes that weird noise when you're talking. So those are things that are just like an absolute nightmare. And if you want to get like real technical, the bit rate when you download it is awful and you almost can't even use it. A lot of Zoom audio calls have been rejected from the directories because of the low bit rate when you download it. We won't get into that, but there is some things you can do to optimize your Zoom. If you're listening to me and you're like, I'm not losing, I'm not learning another software right now. Life is too crazy, but I want to keep, you know, my podcast going, or if I want to go ahead and start it in this time, I get it. A lot of people don't want to learn new things. <laughs> So let me go ahead and tell you, let me read this to you. So this is the best way to get, um, it's not going to be ideal again, but this is a good way to upgrade your Zoom audio if you can. So I believe that they only have, and you might know the answer to this, I believe they only have a desktop app um, for Mac, right? I don't know about Mac. 
I know okay. that there's a mobile app for um, for desktop apps. I mean, for Windows, do you know? They do have a desktop app. I just don't know about Mac, but PC, yeah. Okay, perfect. I have a Mac, so then both both of them have a desktop app. So that's the first thing. Download the desktop app. Don't ever try to record over um, your browser or your internet browser. If you can do it from the desktop app, that's what's really going to um, help it out for stabilization-wise. So when you go into your desktop app, this is when you want to get like a pen and paper out, everybody. Go to your desktop app. Go to Settings. Go to Audio. Go to Advanced. And then you're going to check the box that says enable original audio. That's going to be really important because a lot of people don't know that Zoom automatically compresses your audio and tries to clean it up while you're speaking. StreamYard does the same thing. They try to automatically um, correct the levels, make things sound good, but a lot of times it's over compressed. It sounds weird. If someone, you know, is joining you on a phone, it's even worse because it's like super compressed. And so it's just like, it sounds distorted and terrible. So definitely check that box. So you can be the one who cleans up the audio after you're done recording. Next, if you go to settings, recording, and then record separate audio, that's going to keep you and your guest audio on separate tracks will which will eliminate the audio ducking problem so you'll just add both of your tracks together in post-production and edit it that way but that option is only available for local recording you know how when you record on zoom it asks you if you want to record on the cloud or on the computer that means you have to click record on the computer and that's what will separate it for you it won't separate it if you do it on the cloud so you could do all that, or you can use another software. There's a few different ones you can Good, use. Because I was just about to say, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. That sounds complicated. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to be stubborn and stick with Zoom, that's up to you. So you can use those settings. It still won't be ideal. So you can use um, three different things I like to recommend is Skype. I know it sounds old school, but they totally crushed it with the audio side of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is definitely really good. Um, so you can do Skype, kick it old school. A lot of people still have a Skype account. They just forgot about it so that you won't have any problem joining. Um, there's a place called Ringer. Ringer is really good, you know, like Ringer on the phone. And then my favorite one is Squadcast. Squadcast definitely has uh, kind of fixed a lot of the bugs that a lot of the other remote recorders have had a trouble, like had trouble with. They pretty much like looked at all the problems in the industry and then fixed them all. And so I think it's like nine bucks a month. So you will spend a little bit with Squadcast, um, but it definitely does pay off in the end because you're going to have super... Um, crisp, clear studio level audio, and you're not going to run into any problems with that. And Squadcast has a very similar setup as Zoom, like, hey, send the link, join, that kind of stuff. So that'll be really familiar for you if you are a Zoom user. So Interesting. And there's for $9 a month, there's no limit on how many hours of recording you can do? Um, It might have a limit. I'm not sure. I haven't ever hit that limit. So it's got to be at least decently high. <laughs> But yeah, I they I know they have different tiers too if you're if you need like a ton of audio. So right. that's for the fancier fancier users. Yes, um, exactly. Question from the audience. Um one of the hardest parts I've had has been figuring out opening music or an opener of some some kind. Um any best practices around opening segments? Yeah, definitely. So first things first, you got to be really, really careful with your audio. The podcast world is so black and white strict with music because in the past, uh, you know, podcasts were in iTunes. They're not in iTunes anymore, but it was existing with somewhere that has music. Now, Spotify is an app that has music, right? It's not a, primarily a podcast app. So you definitely want to make sure you have royalty-free music. You can use the audio library um, on YouTube, but that is definitely um, a really good place. Or you can buy royalty-free music. Just make sure that you have um, the certificate um, that they give you if you ever have to prove it. Because I've worked with a lot of podcasters who their shows are just like instantly deleted and they can't get it back because the royalty, you know, 
infringement or they get slapped with a cease and desist. You know, they got to go through legal problems because they picked a random song and they put it on their show and so and so found out and that was their song. So definitely be careful with the music. First and foremost, I always want to like overstress that. Um, so keep your certificate or use something like the YouTube audio library. It'll, it'll save you a lot of headaches. So that is first. And then with the opener, you got to be as short and sweet as possible with your opener because people want to get directly to the content. This is a big trend that's happening now in the podcast world. Kind of when podcast starting, it was like a forever long intro and it was like every week you're going to get X, Y, and Z and blah, 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 blah. Typically now you want your opener to be your name, your show name, and then the subtitle. You know, like welcome to whatever, Cassidy's podcast show where you're going to learn the best tips and tricks in the industry. Here's Cassidy. Like that's pretty much it. You want to keep it like 10, 20 seconds max because a lot of the podcast apps, um, not necessarily Apple and some of the big players out there, but there's some like Overcast and Squadcast or not Squadcast, uh, Overcast and uh, Luminary and things like that. It will actually automatically skip the intro and just start right at the content because podcast users just want to listen to the content, right? So you want to keep your opener just short, sweet, brief, bright, and brilliant and get straight into your uh, content as quick as you can now with the outro that's where you can definitely get a little bit longer that's where you want to have your call to action that's you know that's mostly where people are listening more um so have your call to actions your evergreen stuff like check out the website all those things you know you want to grow join the email list blah 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 so you can go at least like 30 to 40 seconds on your outro specifically but intro don't don't worry about it too much i promise just worry about the music that's what I would say. Because of brief, brief, bright, and brilliant. I like that. But so, and a follow up question on that. But so, what about actually mixing the intro? Should you have a pre recorded intro built by sound engineer, like somebody else, let's say, introducing me if it's my show? Does it elevate? I don't know, does it make it sound more professional? Or are you just saying do your own introduction and just use it on every episode? Yeah, I typically, I like having other voice actors. I think it just kind of breaks it up. It makes more sense. You know, if I, you know, started a new show, I would really think about having um, a male intro just because it breaks it up. You know, you don't, it, I think, this is my personal opinion. I think it sounds weird because typically the style of podcasting now is they have um, you know, the podcaster has an intro themselves that says, hey, thanks for joining me today. We're going to get to X, Y, and Z. Now let's get into the show. And then their evergreen intro comes in with the music and the voice actor. And then it goes into the body of the episode, like the main content, right? Does that kind of make sense? So that's yeah. typically the pattern right now. So if it goes from you to you to you, you welcoming them, you in the <laughs> evergreen intro, you in the uh, main episode, it kind of sounds um, a little bit crazy in my opinion i'm not a big fan of it but there's some um podcasters out there like jennifer allwood jennifer allwood does her own um intro and it sounds great because that's just how she is you know she's like super relatable super likable so i am not a fan of it i would always say use another voice actor if you can um but if you're like i just want to be the one that welcomes them every single week then do that interesting cool Okay, that's just giving me so much clarity now in the, you know, all the missing pieces because uh, with Forum Confidential, with the EO podcast, some of those things were already taken care of, right? I just right. have to take care of asking good, choosing a great guest, asking good questions, and then making sure the sound was good. So just like check mark, check mark, fail. Um, but there were a lot of those other things that then uh, they handled on the on the back end. Um, and so we're at the top of the hour now, but I know that you um, will obviously you help rookies get started and you help people who are already in the podcast game get even better and elevate it. So what is the exact service you offer? Because I know you have some cool programs where um, you take care of a lot of the things for the client. So tell us a little bit about that so that if anybody from our audience you know, says this is great, but I'm still not feeling confident enough to make it happen myself, they can reach out to you and you can help them. 
Yeah, definitely. So two things I want to tell you about. I do want to let you know at the beginning of this, I brought up how you got to be committed to your content. You got to you got to have enough ideas. I do have a webinar I want to offer to you guys. It's totally for free. It's how to come up with a year of podcast ideas. So you can just go to yearofpodcast.com. I can share that link um, with you or I can drop it in the comments myself later. Um, so yeah, definitely go check out that webinar. It's going to help you come up with a year's worth of podcast ideas. It's really going to be able, you're really going to be able to see like year of podcast yeah year of podcast.com yeah so that's really going to be a good clue like can i actually commit to the like the topics kind of rolling around in your head so that's going to be really fun and then after that primarily the main part of our business is launching and producing podcasts so all the things we talked about today and more, we actually do it all for you and just launch it. All you have to do is hit record. So we've got a few launch packages and then we also um, take over the uh, podcast production side of the stuff. So we do like the um, ongoing production, the show notes, the mix mastering, the publishing, you know, to your host server, all that good stuff. So pretty much we try to make podcasting as simple as possible because if all you have to do is think about your content and think about hitting record, then you're going to create some pretty amazing content. So that's our goal. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Cassidy, for your time and all of your incredible insight. I will sign up for the webinar. I can definitely, awesome. I would benefit from some more, you know, creative ideas. And it is about also creating all the content and having all those things right in your pipeline so that you don't run out of steam and, you know, end with, you know, 10 episodes and that's the end of the show that you created that you had uh, referred to before. Thank you again so very much. It was a pleasure having you here.